defining our catchments, one of the main things was to do with pathways that children tended to follow as they went from primary up through to secondary and leaving the school system. So what this map shows is the biggest pathway out of every school. And so the idea was that it was uh, identifying the most significant pathway to a particular to any particular school. So even if they were a school of 40 kids uh, and only five kids left in any year, the most significant pathway was where those five kids went, even though it was immaterial to the school receiving them. It was important to the sending school. So this was where they all go to. And you can see, and, and all I'm showing is the one biggest pathway in, in this map. We're not even looking too much into the trivial ones. So you can see if you look at the north and the southern extremes, particularly, you can see what look like little starbursts of, of arrows. Um, and they are generally all pointing to a, a, a center, which is a high school. So it's multiple primary schools feeding their kids into one particular secondary school. And those are the primary pathways. So you can logically draw a circle around some of those and call those networks. And then we aggregated the networks up and called them catchments. But you get into the middle and good luck trying to find a pattern in that lot. Um, so um, Auckland is, is quite dense. It has a lot of schools in close proximity. And so people are quite likely to make a choice. You know, there's very little to, uh, to choose in terms of distance between one school and another. Uh, the difference between two kilometers and five kilometers, well, I'm in the car anyway, what difference does it make? Um, and so people exercise their choice and we'll see um, intermeshing of networks all over the place. So if we were to overlay people's second choice, people's third choice and, and beyond onto that, you just lose everything under a sea of arrows. So we use this to indicate just what a complex system we're playing uh, with. Um, but, it, but anyway, the, the, pri the point of this was that the primary definition of any particular network was to see, well, how, how closely do schools um, work together and link together and depend on each other? And that was measured by the biggest pathways out of every school. Um, and that we overlaid after that, we overlaid, well, are they actually close to each other? does it make sense because they're local or are they tracking across the whole of Auckland to get to a particular school and it's not something we might want to encourage. Um, and then as I think Janet mentioned earlier, is it a particular structure of group of schools? So have we got generally a, a contributing primary school feeding to a couple of intermediates feeding up to a high school? Or have we got a couple of full primaries in there that you'd think, well, why are they all um, mixing up together? Really, these should be distinct networks and what we need to fix is what's driving some anomalous behavior rather than um, just accepting that the weirdness you know it might be that we've got our structure wrong and we need to change it or it might be that people are avoiding a school for very good reasons and we need to understand that and work around it and make the system suit what people need to do as much as possible we, we should probably say that the reason we've got this diagram is that we geocode the students so oh we yeah we know missing the obvious friends. sorry <laughs> yeah so we so this is showing actual students and their pathways from primary to intermediate to secondary so again, we've got really good information about how many students have we got and where are they? Hmm. Yeah. So the, the, the fun thing is we get to geocode the three quarters of a million students every year. Um, and then from that, that gives us this rich data uh, set that we can slice and dice any which way to um, start to understand patterns and trends. And as we build that up over a time period, of course, you can see how patterns might change over time. Um, so, so these are real students. These are real things happening. These, hmm. you know, showing the pathway of where they go to school and where they transition to. Um, across there. I'm just going to pick up on, I can see Nicholas has asked a question about Rangitoto and catchment. Um, there's also, um, we see different trends. So in Rangitoto, for example, if it's a mature suburb, so if most of the suburb has been built out um, and there's not a lot of scope for intensification, you'll see um, sort of lower growth figures. Um, and the other trend that you might see is cyclical. So families um, move into an area, they have children, those children go up through the pathway to secondary school and then the children leave and the family sell the house and you get a new you get a new new young family move in with small children so it's cyclical so across certain suburbs so how it will be an example you'll see that cyclical trend and some of those eastern bays up towards um, long bay and rangitoto they'd be in a cyclical trend as well I whereas see. whereas the big growth numbers are happening in like the greenfield growth areas i just saw on the map that it <laughs> <laughs> on the map it was sticking at the same population level and i was like okay good it won't need a new school <laughs> Well, that's exactly it. Yes. <laughs> if it's blue, if it's blue, the stats New Zealand are expecting that it's going to stay reasonably static. Um, but just bear in mind that that stats team is sitting down in Christchurch and sometimes they get it wrong. So, you know, for example, we've seen quite a lot of growth in those eastern bays, up those um, up through Browns Bay and, um, you know, all those settlements. They're actually mm. increasing quite, quite high. Um, cool. OK, let's move on to the next um, next slide, if we can. 
Um, there's a couple, there's two slides here. One is, one is primary growth and uh, the other one is secondary and they're modelled out to 2030. So um, essentially what this is telling you is that all of our networks, so here's the 20 catchments, they're all going to go bang. They're all going to be, if we don't do anything, they're all going to be full by 2030. And you get the same pattern across the primary and the secondary. Um, our target, our, our sweet spot is for all of our schools to be between 90 and 95% full. Um, but you can see an awful lot of those catchments there up, well, just about, th there's the 18 out of 20 that are in that 85 to 100% boundary range. And there are the networks that are starting to get over full. Um, you also see, so the yellow bars are the out of zone students. Even if we can, even if those out of zone students were all going to the local schools, those catchments would still be full. So it's a bit of a worry, actually. <laughs> um, we haven't rerun this. This was done, what, a couple of years ago, Nick, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but essentially, this is showing you we need to build um, more schools. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of um, catchments there. So Ormiston Mission Heights is showing it's got spare space. That's because we've got a couple of new schools that are still filling up. Um, uh, essentially, what this means is that we need to monitor really closely. We need to keep doing our demand analysis, running our numbers, and spotting where we need to put, put more growth. Um, and some of the ones that are really high, you can see those sort of greenfield areas coming through, Massey, Fenuapai, Ariwa, will be quite high growth over the long term. But basically, they're all in the same range. <laughs> um, and if we look at the secondary schools, we see something similar. Um, the, the secondary school patterns are a little bit different, though, because if you look at Mount Albert, Howick, Westlake, Rangitoto and Avondale, those, those particular, so each of those catchments has probably got two or three secondary schools in it those catchments are the ones that have got a lot of out of zone students. So you can see the yellow bars there are quite a bit higher. Nick, one of the things you want to comment about those graphs? Yeah, one, one of the things that was interesting in doing this, <laughs> um, until we started looking at Auckland as a, a system, as a whole system, there was an assumption that if you could push out of zoners out and send them back to where they lived, to, to school near home, then that would solve the problem. But if you look at these, you can see, well, if I took all of those out of zoners out, there still isn't enough space to put them anywhere. You'd have to send them to Gulf Islands or, you know, some, somewhere that, that has plenty of space. And the, even then, there isn't enough spare space in the whole system to push them to. So it, it says that's not the answer. And this was really the benefit of moving to the, the, the holistic catchment and whole of region type planning. Historically, it was done at a school or small group of schools level. And you'd say, well, we can fix this group by just making them not take any more out as owners. And you could be blissfully unaware of where those outer zoners turned up when you pushed them out. And you go, oh, hang on. No, because where they'd go next is already full as well. And you get this domino effect go through the system. Uh, and it doesn't really help. <laughs> so yeah. we, we, there's a, you mentioned um, uh, Rangitoto earlier, Nicholas. And um, that, that's a bit of a famous case in point because it's very, very large. Uh, and it has lots of out of zone students. There was this view that they were a problem because they had so many out of zone students. So I modelled what would happen if their outer zoners went back to their local high school. And if they did that, we had to build another two high schools. So they were saving us a fortune. And far from being a problem, they were doing us a big favour at a system level. Um, at an individual school level, they might have been a problem because they have this gravitational field and they're able to just hoover up students as fast as they come, really. Uh, and that doesn't do transport a lot of favours. There's lots of kids crisscrossing Auckland in order to do that. So it's not ideal. But if I look purely from an education point, they're doing us a huge favour, saving us millions. So it was an interesting change of view by, by just analysing it slightly differently. Okay, let's, um, let's move through. Uh, I think we might speed, start speeding up a little bit. Um, so um, the next graphs there, um, these are some examples of some data profiles that we did for some of our catchments. So the first one there is Glenfield Birkenhead North Code. And you can just see the type of information that we're able to capture out of our um, data systems. So we've got student counts on the left hand side, then we've got um, some indicators about attendance and behavior. Um, we've got the ESOL numbers, that's English for speakers of other languages. Um, and we've got the, the achievement data, um, particularly NCEA. And just noting that this is 2017-18 this is data, so it's a bit out of date. And the second, the next slide is the school slide. Um, and again, just, just telling you the type of information that we can grab hold of. Um, so we've got school counts across our primary, intermediate and secondary. Um, we've got counts of early childhood education. And then we move into, um, there's a bit of building condition data on there. Um, the the um, ERO Education Review Office um, metric is important because um, that, that tells us how well a school is governed and whether, um, 
if, if they've got a one to two year era review cycle, that's not a good sign. <laughs> if they've got a four or five era review, that, that's good. Um, and then we've got metrics on the, the teaching workforce. Really, the purpose of doing this was if, if we had a similar lens put on each catchment, we were looking for were there differences or similarities? And if there were similarities, could we address them in similar ways? And they, you know, could there be patterns of responses that we could use to fix a particular problem? And actually, I've skipped over the main, the main purpose of these tables. In the growth and development um, section in the middle there, we've got the net number of spaces that we think we need in the catchment. So how many, how many more classrooms are we going to have to build? That's what that tells you. And you can see the upward trend and the gap, the gap that we need to fill. So that's what those were all about. And they were also good conversation starters when we went out to talk to schools. I'm going to move on to slide 17. Um, this is the school level planning. So Nick, Nick mentioned that we've, we've had a big push to moving to, um, to planning at a catchment level. So planning with groups of schools so we can see what the system effect is. But in terms of investment and going up for money, we do have to actually do business cases at school level. So we still do demand analysis for individual schools. Um, and this, this um, graph here, um, it's just an example. This is one of the North Shore schools. So it's showing you that um, we kind of changed what we do. So we, instead of looking out two or three years or four years and saying, well, we need to build this in four years time, we now look right out to 2043. So we can get an idea of um, how the numbers might play out in the longer term. So we've moved from short term planning to long term planning. So we can see that this school here already has a, a deficit. So it's, it's minus 13 student places. And clearly we're going to have to, this would tell us, we'd make a recommendation that we're going to have to build classrooms at this school. Um, so Nick, do you just want to talk about the graph? Yeah, so not, not too different to the population one we looked at earlier. The black line is, is actual role history and the, the red, green and blue lines on the right hand side are um, if we take the stats projections and apportion them to the schools following their enrollment patterns. So, you know, if they take most of the kids out of a particular area unit, then the same proportion of the growth will be attributed to, to that school. Um, so it should reflect actual behavior patterns. And the, the dotted line in between is a, is a short range finger in the wind, I guess, because the stats wasn't great at short term stuff, but it's quite good at the long term. Short term wise, what we said is we know what school, what kids are in the schools um, and we know how they tend to progress through a school, how many kids stay on from one year to the next. So we could actually model from year level to year level across calendar years what the role was likely to be. The, the difficulty was who would come in. So that dotted line is, is the short range projection. If current trends continue, that's what will happen. Um, and you can see in that one, it's a bit of a, it, it's kinking up and then scarily it goes very high Then it hits the stats projections and they tend to level off, which, which says to me that maybe the growth isn't driven by underlying population growth so much as choice and parental behavior. And that might be one that might, we might fix with an enrollment scheme, for example, um, by modifying behavior. And we're going to move on and talk about enrollment schemes in a minute. Mm, okay. um, so, our, so our most accurate projection there is actually probably the short term projection because it just tracks children moving through the year levels. So we know that in the school, they're going to stay in the school and they just go through the cohorts. Um, but that gives you an idea of how we, how we look at individual schools. Um, and, you, and as I said, that school is going to need classrooms. Without a doubt, it's full. Mm. So we have heaps and heaps of different variables we can apply and we can get bogged down in all sorts of stuff um, that, that could slow us down. But actually, if we look at housing development uh, and work out how many people, look, rule of thumb, uh, the, in Auckland, there's roughly three people per household on average. It varies across Auckland, but roughly, roughly three people per household. And roughly 17% of the population is school age. And it breaks down 8% at primary, 2% at intermediate, 7% at secondary, very roughly. It does vary, but that's, it's good enough to give you a quick assessment of what might be coming your way. So that's kind of, that's how we do it. And that way you can do it on the back of an envelope and not rely on months and months of spreadsheet analysis and anything else. And, and you get an almost as good an answer actually. So it's very, very simple, but this is what we use. This is our rule of thumb. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so when we're looking at those big numbers, so that blue table at the bottom there, that's an actual scenario. That was Unitech, the original um, scenario for Unitech. So if we had 1,400 dwelling numbers, how many children was that going to break down into? And if we had the higher figure, the, two, the 2,189, how many children was it going to be? Hmm. Um, so you can see that we'd, we'd worked out that we could probably add <clears throat> another 500 primary age students to Waterview School and we'd still be okay. Um, and we had plenty of space at intermediate and secondary age, so that wasn't a problem. Um, so you can see that we directly used that rule of thumb to try and calculate you know, um, whether we were going to need a new school or not. And it was hmm. as simple as that calculation in that table at the bottom there. It always disappoints the statisticians in the team, doesn't it? That it's that simple. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes it's not three people per household. It might be 2.9 or whatever. So you generally, from stats, you get that number by local board. But it's a really good estimate. Um, and it's, it's proven to work for us over quite a number of years. 